So our final Trailblazer Award is the Policy for Science Award. Ce que je vous disais, c'est que c'est un nouveau prix cette année qui est remis. Ce prix politique pour la science récompense le travail d'une personne dont le travail, justement, est pionnier en termes de politique et de pratique qui contribue au développement de nouvelles technologies, au renforcement des capacités et aussi aux infrastructures de recherche. This year, the committee selected Dr. Imogen Ko, professor, Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm going to finish reading because it's important that we all understand why you were chosen. Professor Imogen Ko, she's, a, as I mentioned, professor at the Metropolitan University for her work on integrating the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion into the research ecosystem of STEM, including into the policies and practices of funding agencies and government, and into the workplaces of commerce and industry where scientific knowledge may be generated or applied. Long before EDI became street talk within government and academia, She recognized a problem endemic to science. She has had significant influence on where, when, and how EDI has been and is being integrated into policy developed by government, funding agencies, scholarly societies, post-secondary -edu post education, healthcare entities, and commercial and non-for-profit enterprises. Imogen Co has inspired a generation with her championship work on EDI. Bravo. It's very dangerous to give me a podium and a microphone. Um, I want to thank uh, CSPC so much for this award. Um, I have a very conflicted relationship with awards because we know they're one of the skewed merits, uh, skewed metrics that we use to evaluate merit. And if you don't know about the Matthew effect, please go look it up. I can't avoid a teachable moment as a professor. So go look up the Matthew effect. We give awards to people who get awards. But this award is very meaningful to me because it really recognizes the invisible and usually uncredited work that I and others have done in parallel with having a career as an academic research scientist. So there are a number of us who have done that, uh, the, the conventional things that you're supposed to do, get grants, mentor graduate students, uh, publish papers. But at the same time, I've had parallel careers of active, activism and advocacy and engagement with various bodies to help develop and shift policy because we recognized that this was a really important contribution to the community. There never used to be a space for that kind of section to tell what you had been doing on an NSERC discovery grant application or some other application, but there is now because it's an important Uh, contribution and it's a highly impactful ac activity that scientists can engage with. And I've had the privilege, yeah. I've had the privilege to, and, and continue to very much enjoy working with various sectors on embedding EDI principles into research processes. I want to acknowledge that this work builds on the creative work of scholars that have been here for millennia and that we must engage and embrace those learnings, and I commit to continued uh, learning in my own journey um, as a scholar. Um, after hearing about this award, I went back through old emails, Medad, because we've known each other quite a long time, and I wanted to find my first sort of recollections of CSPC, and I think it was about 2015, and it was a there was a meeting in Toronto, and I was on a panel, I led a panel, And there was some discussion from some young people about frustrations with the conference. And I looked around, and I have to say, the makeup of that conference was, shall we say, flawed. <laughs> so um, I came and talked to you about the, the sort of the demographics, and you did what I can only describe as the exact kind of behavior that I would so love to see in leaders everywhere. You did not become defensive. We engaged in a dialogue. We, uh, we talked about how to improve and how to uh, increase the diversity of, of the 
conference uh, over the years, and we did it. We had the first EDI panel in 2016. Um, it was very nerve-wracking. I think I'm the first person to say EDI at a CSPC event. <laughs> Um, it was outside the regular scheduling of the conference, and I didn't know, we didn't know if anybody was going to show up, but the room was full. Um, people wanted to learn more, and we've had panels since then, and they've always been, they've always been um, full. Um, and now, now I listen to people at these uh, events, I listen to the presidents of the funding councils, I listen to, to leaders, and it's almost as if EDI has always been here, and we we're all talking about it so comfortably. Um, we have work to do. I want to thank the participants of those early panels for putting, me, putting their trust in me. Some of them are here. Dr. Shahini Ghosh, you were one of my first. Yeah. Thank you for trusting me. Um, indigenous scholars, uh, Malani Goodchild and Deanna Burgett. I've, I've learned so much. Um, Dr. Dr. Mahadeo Sukai taught me everything about um, creating cultures of accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, by the way, closed captioning, um, ramps and uh, ASL, so we've got some work to do, okay? <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't, I, I was very worried about Kirsty Duncan climbing up those steps this morning. Um, I also want to thank Anna Sophia Barrow as my partner in crime, um, who couldn't be here, but without um, whom none of those panels would ever have happened. I want to thank Toronto Metropolitan University and Stephen, you and your team, for putting this nomination together. This is an institution that changed its name. Remember that universities are medieval, Eurocentric constructs, colonial constructs. They were built by old rich white men for young rich white men. They are designed on exclusionary principles. Exclusion is a feature, not a bug. And yet we have modeled our institutions on this very medieval Eurocentric structure. Um, and we're continually trying to retrofit them. Uh, if I had my way, I would burn them down and we'd start again. <laughs> I have a ton of privilege, I have tenure, I can say these things. Um, we hold these institutions up as if they're the best that we can do, but they're not. We can do better. We really can do better and we must do better. If you're gonna push the agenda on social justice as an academic scientist, you have to have courage. And some of my colleagues have talked about courage. You also have to have humility. And certainly I have privilege, which means I also have responsibility. We have to understand as scientists what it means to be complicit in systems of oppression. And being silent means being complicit. We cannot be silent. If you claim to support individually or institutionally, as I've heard frequently, uh, you can't claim to be in support, for instance, for gender equity or work-life balance, and you want to remove barriers to access for historically excluded groups, then you must challenge and dismantle systems of oppression that seek to control reproductive rights. You may not have heard of an academic scientist say this in a public setting, but I'm gonna say it now. Abortion is healthcare, and we need to protect the rights of people to define their own reproductive destinies. If you want full engagement of all the talent, you need to be sure that all the talent can be fully engaged on their own terms. We must pay attention, much closer attention to the concerns, fears, but also the incredible contributions of queer and trans scientists, of disabled scientists. I want to remind you that tomorrow is LGBTQ2S plus in STEM day. Again, all of those organizations and individuals who said they were committed to EDI, I want, you to, I want to know what you're doing to celebrate that day, make members of that community in your organizations feel welcomed, included, and valued. Data and evidence, the science, the research science, and a shout out to our social science colleagues who do much of this work, data and evidence say that those people still feel discriminated against, harassed, unsafe. Diverse representation is not synonymous with EDI expertise. So don't expect those from historically excluded demographics to carry the workload for EDI initiatives. And let's push the conversation. We need to talk about toxic masculinity in the tech sector. If we're going to promote AI and machine learning, let's talk about the culture. We need to talk about 
white fragility in academia and use these words. We need to talk about racism and sexual harassment in the sciences, whether they be field sciences or laboratory sciences. These are the kinds of things that I hear a lot from uh, trainees, particularly across the country. We can do better. We can have these difficult conversations. We can, we really can. We've come so far. But I really want to push us into these more challenging conversations using this language and so that we can build better, richer, more creative science cultures. A senior male professor once commented how I was always banging on about women in science. And he, <laughs> and he also told a colleague of mine to get off her soapbox, her metaphorical soapbox. And it was really annoying, but you know, the best revenge is living well, or certainly living loud. Um, and so I launched the program Soapbox Science in Canada, and we build real three-dimensional soapboxes. It's rolled out across Canada now. It's one of, the, one of my most, uh, um, I feel you know, wonderful about this uh, particular program. Um, but we have real soapboxes, and we put gender diverse people, scientists, on those soapboxes, and they talk to the public. They talk about their science. They tell people about their passions for their science. Um, and we bring science to the public. They share the science. And I'm not getting off my soapbox. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so finally, just to the young people in the room, in the audience, you have a champion in me. I will sponsor you. I will maybe mentor you. I'm not a great mentor, but I'll certainly champion you. Um, and my DMs are always open as long as Elon, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have a voice. You have, um, and you deserve to use that voice. And you have a reasonable, a reasonable expectation. It is reasonable to expect that other people will shut up and listen to you that other people will make space for you. So be bold, use your voice. And with one more very deep gratitude and, and thanks, I will now shut up. <laughs> that the selection committee did a very good job this year. Yes. Congratulations to all the award winners. Merci et bravo à tous les lauréats. C'est ici que se termine la cérémonie.